Hello Internet! Today we're going to look at one of the coolest shader editors I have found. Uh, this is Code Life, which is a, a GLSL shader editor. Kind of looks like this. It didn't give it away. Uh, and so the cool thing with this is you'll notice the background is this really weird thing that you wouldn't expect to see in a shader editor or in, a, in any IDE really. There's this green to red shift. The cool thing is that isn't just the background. That's my shader. Uh, so you can see the output up here. This is just some of the sample stuff. And the cool thing is you can do uh, vertex shaders, you can do tessellation shaders, you can do geometry shaders, and you can do fragment shaders. We're going to be working with fragment shaders because that's the easiest. Uh, and so what I've done is just create a really, 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 really basic shader. And all it does is draw the X coordinate on the uh, in the red channel and the Y coordinate in the green channel. So we get one at the top for green and then zero at the bottom. Uh, and then on the right side, we get X equals one. So <clears throat> our texture starts in the bottom left and goes to the top right. Just something to keep in mind. <laughs> and so the cool thing is, is this edits or updates in complete real time. So I can change the Z, uh, it's not going to work because it's only a vector 2, but I can change it and you can see we get errors immediately. And if I change it to something that actually works, like say 0, it updates immediately, which is awesome because it means as I'm typing a shader, I can actually see the errors and what's actually what it would actually look like, which is sweet. <laughs> so what I wanted to do is build sort of a, a graphical editor. And so the idea is, you know the classic math formula, uh, y equals some function of x. We're going to make that. And so the idea is you're going to be able to code some sort of function, plug it into your shader, and the part above whatever your value is is going to be one color, and the part below is going to be a different color. And so the cool thing is you can actually get a, or you can convert a Boolean function into a float. Which we'll get into in a second. First, we need our function. So, ah, <laughs> one sec, my mic has slowly collapsed onto my keyboard. <laughs> so, what we're going to do is we have this function. We need to write, uh, and that's going to be float. The output is going to be a float. And we're going to say uh, y equals some function of x. Let's do uh, pow of x. And let's not even do this. Let's just say our function call of x. We're just going to leave it like that for now. We need a semicolon. You can see we've got a whole bunch of things. Uh, function call isn't defined and x isn't defined. So let's do those. We need to give it a function. So let's return a float from this because a y needs to be a float. And let's just create function call. And this is going to accept a float of x and return some value. So we want to return, uh, I guess, the most basic. Let's just create a, li a line. So f of x. <laughs> cool. But x isn't defined down here. Uh, scrolling is extremely insensitive. Uh, I am on a 4K monitor, so this text initially was super small. You can see all the menus are probably illegible. That, uh, I haven't found a way to figure, fix that yet. Luckily, the text scales, but nothing else does. So I'm still trying to figure all that out. I'm fairly new to this tool myself. I found it a few hours ago. Uh -huh. Just people were talking about it on Twitter, and I was like, that is something I want. Uh -huh. We need x defined. So x is going to be our input data uh, v text chord dot x. Cool. So we have x, we plug that into our function of y, and we get that out. So if I just give it x, you see we get back to where we were initially. So our x is going from 0 to 1. Great. So now we have a function. I need to do something with that. So we're going to have above. I don't know if that's a great name for it, but that's what we're going to call it. Uh, so above is going to be equal to uh, y is greater than our input data dot v. We're going to do our texture coordinate dot y. 
And so this is going to throw an error. This doesn't work. But what does work is casting this uh, Boolean result to a float, which means above is now going to be 1 when y is greater than our texture coordinate, and it's going to be 0 if it isn't, which is great because it means we get a nice hard line. Uh, so if I plug that in here, we get this nice. It's not quite straight because it's actually stretched for my, to fit my screen, but you get the idea. If I go and look at the actual output image, it is actually a straight line. So we can use that to do all sorts of fun things. So let's plug in two colors here. Uh, let's say I want the top to be just a hard green, uh, red, green, and then the bottom to be just red, which will be one minus above. Cool, so bottom's green, top's red. I uh, don't know if that's what I said I wanted it to be. I don't really remember, but you get the idea. We now have this nice segmented thing, and I can actually increase the size of this. You probably can't see that, but under project, there's a properties for the resolution. If I kick that up to like 1920 by 1080, you can kind of see it update a little bit. Uh, that's actually changing because of the aspect mode is changing. But if I change that to 1920 by 1920, we get sort of a better line. It's still not perfect because you would need to match the aspect ratio of your screen, and I don't remember mine. <laughs> so we're just going to go like this. Hopefully this is straighter. It's hard to tell. But you get the idea. We can plug anything we want into this. So if I want to get like a, a nice parabola type thing, we can do uh, the power of x squared. And now you have a nice curve. Cool, right? So now we're just, we have a graph and it updates in real time as I change these functions. We can do uh, power uh, cubed. But the thing is, is this only goes, uh, we are only in a single coordinate system between 0 and 1. Uh, so x is from 0 to 1 and y is from 0 to 1. That's cool-ish, but I want to go a little bit further than that. I haven't figured out how to add variables yet, but we can just do that here. And so float uh, x min, we'll set that equal to zero. Float x max, set that equal to say, uh, let's actually change this a little bit. Let's do 10 and negative 10. And so this way our x minimum will be negative 10, our x max will be 10. The total range is going to be 20. We're going to have to calculate that. Uh, our y min is going to be negative 10. And our y max will be 10 as well. Or yeah. So this way we have a range of 20 and 20. So we should see a little bit more happen here. We're not doing anything yet, but it's, it's there. We're not getting any errors. So now we need to calculate the range of everything. This function doesn't need to change. It's just getting an x value and outputting a y value. So neither of these need to change and none of this needs to change. That's just detecting if our, actually that's wrong. <laughs> We're using our input deck or texture coordinate here and here. Uh -huh. Not really thinking about that. We need to convert that into this new vector space. Uh, so the way that's going to work is we're going to have an actual uh, X position. Yeah, it's probably best to do these separately. I don't know if that eh, we'll do it anyway. <laughs> Input data V texture coordinate dot X. And we need to multiply that by the difference between the two. Uh, so I need this to end up being 20, which is going to be Y or X max minus x min and so that's going to be the the difference uh the difference of 10 minus negative 10 is just going to be 20 that's what we want but i want it to start at x min so this way we have negative 10 plus 20 uh which should give us some range there and then i can do the same thing for our y position y y y y Awesome. And now if I swap these out, these texture coordinates, we should now be in that new space. So if I just change the X, we get this very 
steep line because we're still zero to one on our Y scale, but now our X scale is huge. So if I change that, hopefully this works or my mic will fall onto my keyboard and we'll just type a lot of sevens. One sec. Okay. Let's undo that. <laughs> and so if I swap this out for the X position and do this with the Y position, huzzah. Now this is cool because <laughs> now we have this range of stuff we're doing. This is everything. The green side is going to be everything that is less than our Y than our function value Ec or the red side is everything that is greater than it. And so this is exactly what you would expect with a, a cube. Uh, so it kind of goes get you get that classic S shape. If I go back to a power, a square, we get a nice parabola. And if I just put that at one, we get a nice straight line. This doesn't look any different, but the other two do. They look sweet. <laughs> so this is awesome. What if I do the log of X? Yes, that works too. So this way you can just kind of plug in any functions and effectively we've made a graphing calculator that can do so much more uh, because we can actually modify this to add really anything we want. And the cool thing is, is I'm not really limited to just doing one of these functions. I can do one on every single channel. Uh, if I wanted to do like calculus and have, uh, what's a good way to, to experiment with that? Let's do, uh, I don't know if that's, <laughs> this is a good idea, but we're going to do linear power and non power. I don't really need functions for all of these, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> and so pow, uh, linear cube and square and cube. What am I doing? <laughs> this is the part where it's like, oh, this is cool. Let's let's explore this more. I don't know what to do. Let's just plug things together and see what happens. So what I want to do is effectively do three different things of calculus. So given, uh, say, a, a cube or a square root or not a square root, given a, some, a function that's a square, we're going to expect it to kind of do that normal parabola. But what I want is I want to get the integral of that and I want to get the derivative of it, which in this case is just that and that. Yeah, not really, but you get the idea. <laughs> Making this up as I go, it's been a while. So we're going to we're going to play with this. <laughs> so I can I have these X and Y positions. We calculate those and then we check if it's above or below. I want to extract this out into a function because why not float? Uh, can I actually do this? Get result. Sure. <laughs> and so if we plug in our Y result here and our Y position, this is just not worth extracting into a function. I'm I'm thinking way too like lambda e and java e or just c sharp e or whatever you want to call it and trying to like extract all of this and make functions out of it it it, it doesn't really work the way I want it to uh, so we have x y and above we can calculate this which is going to be our linear above going to call this linear and then I want to do this two more times. That's all going to blow up on me because we're duplicating variables, but I can just get rid of those the part where everything goes a little bit less neat <laughs> square and cube. And then we can call this the square above and the cube above. So these functions should all be related to one another. And so the cool thing is, I'm hoping if I do linear here, uh, linear above there, square above there, and cube above there, those aren't defined. Let's define those. Float and float. 
Now we get three functions. One of those is not right. <laughs> this one is not right. But you could, so the white is going to be where all of them overlap. The green is going to be our square function. The uh, blue is going to be our, our cubic function. And then our red is our linear function. So we kind of get, you can kind of see where things are overlapping, where they're different, how they all relate to one another. And we can kind of change the scale if we need to. Like if I want to spread out, I can do that. Or if I want to zoom in, because all the action is happening right there, we can do that too. And it all just happens magically, like instantly. That's cool. Uh, this works on Mac, Linux, and PC. I'm on PC. I haven't tested it on Mac or Linux, but they had binaries for them, so I'm assuming it works. Uh, but I will post a link to get this in the description. You guys can check it out. Definitely recommend it. They've got some really cool stuff. You can actually plug like meshes in here or whatever. And you should be able to take these and plug these into most game engines. This isn't a surface shader for like Unity purposes, but you can plug this into a Unity fragment shader and it's just, it's going to work. So yeah, I'll leave this here and you guys can let me know what you think. If there's other stuff you want me to play around with in this or just questions you have, let me know and we can definitely take, take a look. But yeah. That's it for this video, so until next time, see you internet.